everybody. Um, as I was telling someone earlier, as you know, this isn't a covered bridge, but it's uh, a covered library. <laughs> and it's a pretty special building. Um, I think most of the village, if not all of the village, is on the historic register, as is this building. And it was built in 1883, and the upstairs mezzanine, if you get a chance to look around up there, that was added around 2000. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome. We have, um, in addition to a few of our members, we have a number of guests from far away. We have uh, some Vermont Cover Society people who thank you for coming to join us. And we also have some people I don't recognize, so that's great. Um, my name is Bill Caswell. I'm president of the National Society for the Preservation of Cover Bridges. And we're having this meeting here today, um, kind of a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the building of the Mill uh, Covered Bridge right across the green from here. So um, Arnold Graydon, who built it, is sitting in the back row back there. Yeah. And his father and his, his brother Stanley. And it's nice that 50 years later, you can, you can still be with us to uh, enjoy it. Um, I want to introduce Devin Coleman, who is Vermont State Architectural Historian. He's had a, a great opportunity to, to do some very interesting work on Nichols Powers, and I don't want to spoil any of his presentation, so I'll just let it go with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, well, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. Great to have all you folks here in Vermont. Welcome. Um, it's a good place to be, we think, the Vermonters. And today I'll be talking about the life and work of Nichols Powers. And uh, I'm going to start off by saying this is not an exhaustive review of every bridge that Nichols Powers built. <laughs> that information is out there. It's in some great books. What I really want to look at is who was the builder? Who was Nichols Powers? And what can we, you know, we know the bridges that he left behind and the buildings that he left behind, but who was he as a person? and what can that tell us about life in the late 19th century, the life of a bridge builder. Um, so I want to share some, in, some of the things that I've found um, through this project that I've been working off and on over the last probably four or five years, I'd say. Um, and actually, the very first uh, introduction to Nichols' powers was not a bridge. I didn't know the guy built bridges. I knew him through the Kingsley Grist Mill which is in Clarendon, and we have the owners of the property here in the front row. And this was, uh, came to my attention when I was fresh out of grad school at UVM and doing some consulting work and was hired to write the National Register of Historic Places nomination for the Kingsley Grist Mill. And this photo on your left is taken from this covered bridge, which crosses the gorge. And uh, there's a view inside the bridge. Uh, Powers, ironically, did not design the bridge, um, but he built the grist mill. And here's another view of it. Um, I think that I think that's a photo you gave me early on. Early on. <laughs> so definitely a labor of love on uh, saving and stabilizing and restoring this incredible mill building. And there is a roadside historic site marker by the bridge uh, that talks about the Kingsley Grist Mill. And note that it says the last of a dozen mills that dotted the Mill River. It's the last one because all the others washed away. Floods. And there's a reason that the Kingsley Grist Mill survived. I think it's because Nichols Powers designed it and built it. Um, he didn't do the others. Um, in Tropical Storm Irene, I thought for sure the mill was a goner. I, there was so much devastation. And I, I happened to be heading through Rutland County for another site visit um, early September 2011 and thought, I'm just going to swing by and see what's left. It was still standing, even though I mean, you can see the major supports, this whole bottom wall of the mill is blown out and down the river somewhere. Um, there's nothing, I think, Ron, you were there when I stopped by and you were, you know, putting steel jacks underneath and, right. you know, just getting it stabilized. But the structure itself, there was enough redundancy 
built into the mill structure so that if one support, two supports, three supports were washed away, the load transferred down to all the other supports and kept the structure standing. And that's how a covered bridge works. The multiple small members working together supporting the entire structure. And if one member cracks or fails, the whole bridge doesn't collapse. The loads transfer through the rest of the, uh, the trusses. So this was really great and it's been fixed up. And is it still on Airbnb? It sure is. If you want to stay there, it's on Airbnb. So book, book your... Cards. <laughs> it's, it's really a neat spot because inside they've, they've saved as much as the framing and the, you know, these are the, uh, the rods for all the machinery. I think one of the, gris, the, the millstones is right down here. So you can really get a sense of how the mill functioned. And it was a gravity, uh, gravity feed mill based on the Oliver Evans uh, design. And Nichols Powers, I think, the reason it's still there through the 27 flood, through Tropical Storm Irene, is because Powers um, so ingeniously built that redundancy into the framing. So a few years later, I'm working for the State uh, Historic Preservation Office, and I get a call from Nicholas Strom Olson. And he's working on a grant project in Wallingford, I think. And he casually mentions, as we're finishing up a phone call, oh yeah, and I'm the, the great, great, great grandson of Nichols Powers. Antenna go up, it's like, really? Interesting. Kind of make a mental note. And then we're talking again later about something else. He says, oh, did I mention my dad still lives in Nichols Powers' house? Uh. Really? <laughs> and so this is the house. And I looked it up in our state survey. and. Sure enough, there's a little blurb, home of Nichols Powers, uh, noted bridge builder. And that's interesting. And then we're talking again. And I see, find a few more photos of the property uh, driving through Rutland County again. I just take a little detour and it looks pretty neat. And finally, uh, Nicholas Tom Olson mentions, oh, yeah. And there's a bunch of old stuff in the attic. <laughs> if you want me on your case, <laughs> tell me that you have stuff in your attic and I will, I will pound you <laughs> until I get there. So, but before we dive into what was in the attic, uh, let's do a little history of the Powers family. And, you know, we're in Woodstock today and the Powers name in Woodstock is very prominent. A lot of well-known Powers descendants settled here. There must be some connection somewhere. I, I, I haven't done all the genealogical research for that, but um, th there's, there must be some, some link. But the family goes back to 1650, when Thomas and Walter Power, no S, uh, come to America and settle in Massachusetts. Uh, Jeremiah Powers is born in Quabbin, and then marries Elizabeth Cooley, whose father owned land in Pittsford, Vermont. So that's the Vermont connection. That's what brings the family from Massachusetts to Vermont. And 1775, Richard Montgomery Powers is born. He marries Polly Carpenter, and one of their children is Nichols Montgomery Powers. So that's the background. And the big question, Nichols or Nicholas? His plagued bridge historians for decades. Um, or at least some of us who think about these things. So in doing research on this and looking at some research done for the nomination of the Brown Covered Bridge as a National Historic Landmark um, by the National Park Service, it became clear that in most documents written by somebody else, not by Nichols, the name has an A in it. It's Nicholas. <laughs> when somebody else's hand is writing it, there's an A. So the marriage uh, registration. The census. Clearly there's an A in there. And note his job is bridge builder. <laughs> in his own hand. This is his last will and testament. There is clearly no A, N-I-C-H-O-L-S, Nichols. 
So that, that was pretty convincing, but maybe not definitive. So let's look back at the family tree. Mentioned Richard Montgomery Powers married Polly Carpenter. Polly's parents were Daniel Carpenter and Lucy Nichols. Her maiden name was Nichols. So Nichols Montgomery Powers, his maternal grandmother's maiden name was Nichols. It would make sense that that is the correct spelling of his first name. So that's what I'm going with. Um, from, from now on, it, it's Nichols. Were they, were they from Danby? Uh, that I'm not sure. Yeah. So they had 13 children. Yeah, these are big families. And, and Nichols uh, was one of seven boys. And, you know, Polly Carpenter Powers, here's a picture of her. So this is the, the daughter of Lucy Nichols Carpenter, mother of Nichols Montgomery Powers. And look at her, look at her lifespan, 1776, American Revolution to 1863 Civil War. Like her life spanned these incredible events in our nation's history perfectly. And boy, she was a tough cookie. <laughs> so. so some interesting things that turned up in other places. This is actually from Covered Bridge Topics. You know, this is a postcard that somebody saw reason to publish that says Nichols Powers birthplace Proctor Vermont. It's, it, says it, it says Nicholas, yes. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's nothing more than a cellar hole, you know, a pile of stones. Why somebody thought they need to make a postcard of that? I don't know, <laughs> but it's pretty interesting that, that when this was done, there, there was interest, right, he was well known enough. Um, even back in the early 20th century when this would have been printed, for someone to think, maybe a postcard of hit the cellar hole where he was born will sell. So he married Lorette Fish in 1844. Yeah. Did you read the last? The builder really spells Yes. Yeah. So that was, I think, from the 2016 Covered Bridge Topics. So the, the name has been corrected gradually. Does the back of it look like a postcard? Or is it, it... That I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I haven't seen the actual um, document. Oh, the shape of it. Yeah. So he married uh, Lorette Fish in 1844. And note here, occupation mechanic mm. is interesting. Uh, and the, the spelling again with a, a Nicholas. Yep, and Lorette Fish, her family was from Ira, Vermont. And so here's the Powers house uh, in a historic photo that they had, little horse and buggy over on the side here. And this is in Clarendon, Vermont, which is near Rutland. And on this map, we have N.M. Powers. And there's his house. And right across the street is T.K. Horton. Horton built the covered bridge at the Kingsley Grist Mill. So these two guys are neighbors and probably master and student. <laughs> you know, trading information, trading tools probably. Um, but it shows what a small community this was um, of covered bridge builders. So this is the Powers House. And it's a really beautiful building, brick building with these uh, recessed arches, originally a federal style building that was then updated in the Italianate style. Um, I think that this is Gratz Powers, who would have been Nichols' grandson. I'm not sure who these two figures are, but Gratz, um, he was pretty instrumental in keeping Nichols Powers' name out there and saving a lot of the family uh, materials. This is the house as it appears today. Um, it is really untouched. Um, it has not been, 
it, it's been vacant for quite some time. Uh, descend, the family owns this house as well as the house right next door. So the family lives in the house next door. And they're slowly, uh, this has been kind of tied up in a family estate for a while. They've finally resolved that. So now they're, they're doing some cleanup and organizing in the main house. But it's really, you can envision Nichols Powers showing up today and saying, yep, that's my house. That's right. It has not been changed. And the great thing, down in the basement, inscribed in the plaster, uh, it says up here, plastered, not quite, maybe November, November 4th, maybe, but 1871, Perfect. house built, B-I-L-T, 1823. And that corresponds with other information we have about the doctor who built this house originally in the 1820s. Federal style fits right in that time period. This is downstairs? Yes, down in the basement. And so, you know, Nichols Powers became very well known for his work, as, as we know. And this uh, the Vermont Historical Society has a small collection of papers that came to them through one branch of the family. And this letter really uh, jumped out at me as a pretty sound endorsement uh, from the, uh, based on his work on the Susquehanna Bridge. Uh, you know, I know of no more reliable person anywhere than he is. He's skillful, entirely trustworthy. Uh, he was in charge of this bridge. He will never fail to perform satisfactorily anything he will undertake. So Powers was very well known and respected uh, within his field. So let's go back to the attic. <laughs> you got there in that house? Yes. Oh. This is the attic of Powers' house. Oh. So when, when, yeah, well, no, it's, it's a little, a little clean. Little clean. <laughs> Some things have been shoved over. <laughs> um, so when Nicholas Strom Olson, Powers' great-great-great-grandson, said there was some stuff in the attic, this is what I found. <laughs> it's stuff. I mean, we're talking an old feather mattress, uh, rolls of wallpaper, old lawn furniture, random you know, magazines, bits of furniture. And it was really interesting because the stuff closest to the stairs was from like 1920 to 1940, which is really the most recent full-time occupancy of the house. You go to the middle of the attic, and it's from about 1900 to 1920. You go to the back third of the attic, and it's you know 1870s to 1900. So they just sort of filled it up <laughs> from back to front, and it was pretty incredible because there was so much stuff up there that it was really just pawing through layers and finding things um, what's known as ephemera little bits and pieces of mailings and catalogs and things that were never meant to last unless they're tossed in the attic <laughs> and forgotten things like Wow. These little promotional cards, uh, you know, sent to to Nichols Powers for you know C. W. Fisher. This is probably Clellan Fisher, who went on to become a very well-known architect in Burlington, Vermont. He had a hardware business in Boston before that. Wow. So th this is a little three by five card that. Who knows if any more of these exist? <laughs> but they threw it in the attic. And, you know, C.W. Norton, uh, bills of lumber, doors, sash, blinds, finishing stock in Middletown Springs, Vermont, you know, were these sources where Powers was getting materials for his projects? Probably. Or this little mailing from the Berlin Iron Bridge Company. I'm not aware of any iron bridges that Powers built, but he knew about the technology. And this this is so great. This is a front and back postcard, and it's basically a mail order bridge where you fill in the blanks. Number of spans required. 
width of the alignments, you know, what's, what's your clearance, how wide do you want it, how long do you want it, and you mail it back and then they'll send you a quote. It's, and this is, you know, 1870s, 1880s, you know, it's really, really a progressive marketing plan. And that's uh, the kind of thing you can tease out through this ephemera. This little handwritten postcard to Nick Powers Esquire. Some sound a little fancy. It says, your timber is at North Clarendon Bridge. Go and use it, please. <laughs> December 13th. So I'm not positive which bridge, but it, it may have been this one, uh, which is no longer standing. This was lost in the uh, 27 flood. But this little postcard tells us a lot about how a bridge builder work, worked. Uh, note the date. December 13th is winter. So bridge building was a winter activity, which, if you think about it, makes sense. The ground is frozen. You've got to haul around these huge timbers, easier to do on snow and ice. Um, the rivers are lower, maybe even frozen, so you can work over safer conditions. And Powers, in the summer, he ran a dairy farm and a cheese factory. He didn't have time to build bridges in the summer. So he built in the winter. And this is how people communicated in those days. Exactly. Any postcard. Yep. No telephones. Yep. No internet. No so when, when he knew that his order of lumber that he had placed at some mill, they notified him with this little postcard. It's all set. Get to it. <laughs> and the, all, all these little scraps of paper, they're just on the floor of the attic in between you name it, old shoes and dirty shirts and whatever they threw up there. So there was a, a big article, a lengthy article about uh, Powers in Vermont Life magazine in 1955. And you know, one of the quotes that jumps out at me is, is that it says, Nick wasn't much on the book learning, but he was a whiz with the practical putting together of timbers. And you know, if, if there's one, one thing that I'd like to refute, it's that, that book learning. This is kind of playing up the myth of, oh, the backwoods farmer who's a genius, does never, you know, self-taught, never learned anything, couldn't read or write. Nick Powers was very smart. And he knew what he was doing. So the, I think this sells him a little short to play him off as just kind of this who knew type person that, that this guy in Vermont could do such things because, uh, oh, and who, you build models? Yeah. Have you seen this model in Pittsburgh? No. It's on display at the Historical Society. It's amazing. <laughs> it's probably about this long. Um, it's a model for a bridge uh, that Powers, Powers built the model. The bridge was never built. It's a crazy design, <laughs> but the model is spectacular. Is, yeah. is that the, one of the first ones that he had? I understand that he began designing these bridges mm -hmm. when he was a teenager, right. even like 15, 16. Yeah. Years. Would this yeah. have been one of his early? Possibly, years? yeah, just sort of testing out different configurations. Yeah. Yep. So, also among these papers uh, are trade catalogs. You know, this for a universal radial drill. Uh, you know, machine tools, modern machinery. So again, was Powers the backwoods guy with a, you know, a hand drill and hammer and chisel? Yeah, he probably used those tools, but he also knew about the most, you know, the latest technology that was available. Uh, this advertisement from the Akron Iron Company for steel rim pulleys, uh, wood split pulleys, you know. Was Powers use ordering machinery for the Kingsley Grist Mill from the Akron Iron Company? Possibly. Uh, riveting machinery for boiler work and bridge building. So he was very up on modern technology, what was out there, uh, and what was available. Pneumatic riveting machinery company. These, this broadside is probably my favorite piece. It's about four feet tall, maybe 
three feet wide, been uh, from S.C. Johnson and Company, New Haven, Connecticut, iron work for buildings, wrought iron bridges, you know, these beautiful printed, all these various details uh, that you could just order by mail and it would come on the railroad. Rutland being a railroad city, very easy to get all these materials. Van Doren ironworks, wrought iron fences. Um, so these are all the types of catalogs that Nichols Powers was receiving routinely. And I would argue that somebody who's not much on the book learning <laughs> isn't subscribing to the safety valve newsletter. Um, let's see if I can find the exact heading. This is a very technical, a monthly journal for the steam user and engineer. That's not casual reading. <laughs> so Powers was subscribing to this as well as the model home. This was a publication out of Rutland, Vermont. This is volume one, number one, a sample copy sent and you can just see NM Powers written up at the top in pencil uh, featuring uh, SD of the SD Organ Works in Brattleboro. Um, so these are all, all uh, materials being sent to Nichols Powers. Mechanics, a journal of engineering and mechanical progress. Building, a journal of architecture. You know, he was very well versed in what was going on in the world of mechanics, engineering, construction, architecture. The power and transmission, you know, all about, you know, the mill. It's all about getting the power of the water to the wheel, to the turbine, to the millstones. And, you know, this, this piece here, the New England homestead, just in case you were thinking, well, maybe these were his son's materials. The mailing label is still glued to it. <laughs> N.M. Powers, Clarendon, Vermont. So this was Nick Powers. Yeah, we're still yeah. looking at, at all documents that you found in this the attic. all from the attic. Oh, wow. Yeah, just plowing through. And, you know, some things, there was one trunk full of old sheet music where you pick it up and it just disintegrates. Luckily, most of these are printed on rag, you know, higher quality paper, uh, uh, cotton paper uh, instead of wood pulp. So they survived uh, incredibly well. Uh, catalogs. This is Walker Hatch and Company, molding sash, doors and blinds, frames and brackets out of Burlington. They were down on the waterfront, where it's a big manufacturing uh, industry of uh, mass producing these elaborate Italianate doors and windows and uh, sash. And the house that Nichols Powers lived in was updated in the Italianate style when Powers bought it. And he probably ordered a lot of that woodwork from a catalog such as this one. There are letters, handwritten letters. Uh, this one from Reuben Cummins of Troy, New York to Nichols Powers, where he's talking about he has to build a bridge in Johnsonville over the Norwich River. And then he describes how much he'll pay so this is a really interesting glimpse of kind of the labor practices. What, what were people earning and what were the different positions? A foreman, $3 a day. A good razor, 2 to 250 a day. A good bridge carpenter, 250 to 275 a day. Good and poor helpers, so apparently they weren't picky. Um, $1.75 to 225 a day. So, so you know, definitely a hierarchy in the knowledge and the, uh, the skill of the people working on the bridges. And letters like this. This is from a selectman uh, in East Poultney, Vermont, saying, sir, we have a bridge. We want to have someone examine and see what to do with it. Will you come and see if we build one and do not let you the job? We'll pay you for your troubles of coming here. We have two bridges we do not know about. Will you come immediately and see? And what's really interesting is that this shows how essential bridges were to daily life. 
if your bridge goes out, you're stuck. Because there's maybe only one way in and out of your town. In Vermont, that in Tropical Storm Irene, there were several towns cut off when their one bridge was washed away. So in East Poultney, you can tell, you know, please come and see. Come immediately. You know, we really need to take care of our bridge. Yes? You can tell by the letterhead that Mr. Dewey is, you know, carriages, sleighs, and wagons, and that's his yeah. life clothes. Yeah, exactly. He, he was very dependent on having a good bridge. Yep. Uh, this is from George Parker and Son, uh, selling roofing slate. And uh, this is talking about a, a quote that Powers had requested for roofing slate. I'm not sure what project it was for. I think, I believe the Brown Bridge is the only covered bridge with a slate roof. Mm. This is not the right date for that project. Um, it would be great if they matched up, but they don't. Um, but So this may have been for an, another building project. And this is one of my favorites. This is a letter uh, from C.P. Phobes & Co. over in Crown Point, New York, where they're describing what they can supply in terms of a stair rail. Uh, the price is for a common turned walnut newel, $4.00 the newel being this piece at the, the bottom. Uh, two inch balusters were 19 cents each. A straight handrail, uh, 22 cents a foot. <coughs> and then they talk about the difficulty of making the twisting handrail, but offer a 10 inch octagonal newel paneled for $15. Wow. That is this newel post. <laughs> It's octagonal, it's paneled, it's 10 inches at the base. Um, and that lines up exactly with 1871, 1872, when Powers was making these changes to the house. So to find you know, this letter, and this is exactly what the staircase looks like in the house today, this beautiful, curving, federal style staircase. Yep. Mm -hmm. So as a builder, um, there were drawings in the attic. Now, I don't know if Nichols Powers drew these. It may have been one of his sons who also did some building. Um, but somebody was planning out a, a very rudimentary house with floor plans on the back of it, uh, which I'm doubting this was built as, you know, here's the bedroom, and here's the pantry, and the stairs, there's, well, there's no heat. <laughs> there's no fireplace or anything. One large room here, but, you know, trying to put these spaces together. Um, somebody was, was working on these uh, simple designs, and you can see here on the elevation, there's clearly a chimney coming up the middle. <laughs> there's no chimney in here. The Rutland County Courthouse. Who's here from Rutland? A couple folks. So this was really interesting. The, the original courthouse, as it was built, not by Powers, had this tower centered on the roof of the building. If you go today, the tower is at the front of the building. And what happened is that after it was built, they realized the weight of that tower on the center of the roof, it wasn't structured properly. And actually, the, the tolling of the bell in that tower would completely disrupt the court proceedings in the courtrooms directly below. <laughs> so they hired powers to actually move this entire tower to the front of the building. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> it is, it's, if you go and look at the building and think, how would they do that today? Let alone, how would they do that uh, in the 1870s? Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, West Rutland, uh, known for its 
marble quarries. Uh, Powers designed and built some of the very first derricks, which are uh, these mechanisms with a mast and a boom used to hoist the blocks of marble out of the quarry and swing it around to grade level where it could then be worked. So here's some of his engineering knowledge coming into play. The Clarendon Congregational Church steeple. This is just walking distance from the front yard of Nichols Powers' house. Um, it was, this was the original uh, sort of open, more uh, federal style steeple and it was replaced in 1881 with this uh, pointed steeple built by Nichols Powers. And some of, there's some element, some little hat, maybe one of these, although they're there, something from this tower he took and put on his barn and it's still there today. <laughs> some little half window. The First Baptist Church in Wallingford. Um, these are little newspaper notices uh, saying that uh, the society, the church society, is indebted to N. Powers of Clarendon, who came and gave the direction uh, to raise the bell into the steeple for free. You know, that, I think he was a pretty nice guy. <laughs> you know, these, these reports that he had the knowledge and the skills and he was willing to go and give his skills to the church to get their bell into their steeple uh, for free. He was also building dams. Here's a notice about Nichols Powers of Clarendon building the new dam across the Otter Creek with bulkheads. Um, so in addition to just you know, bridges, just bridges, <laughs> mills, moving courthouse towers, he was building dams and controlling the flow of water. So very skilled engineer on multiple levels. This is most intriguing. Um, anyone recognize that building? That's the Vermont State House. Um, devastating fire um, in 1857. And the letter on the left is a, an endorsement. It's signed by six or seven individuals who are saying things like Nichols Powers has had large experience in setting out extensive and complicated frameworks. We regard the high order of skill which he has exhibited as second to none. So who is this letter going to? It was going to the Honorable Thomas E. Powers. He was a Powers from Woodstock. Maybe a distant relative, we don't know. But who was Thomas E. Powers? He was the superintendent in charge of reconstruction of the State House. So here's a letter from Nichols Powers Associates saying this guy's really good to the superintendent in charge of rebuilding the State House. It sounds like Powers was trying to get the job to rebuild the State House. He didn't. Um, gone through all the record books, worked with the state curator. Nichols Powers' name doesn't show up anywhere. Um, but that, that shows, you know, for one thing, he was ambitious. You know, he was out there. This is his letter of introduction to the, the director of the reconstruction saying, I'd like to do this. And here's, here's uh, you know, my letter of recommendation. So he, he wasn't just sitting in Clarendon waiting for jobs to come to him. He was actively seeking them out. This is the death notice for Nichols Powers. Um, it's interesting, died at age 79. Occupation, farmer and mechanic, not bridge builder. So it's interesting how, uh, how things get portrayed and then other aspects come to light later on. This is from the family. This is a little uh, card from his funeral, a beautiful uh, printed card. And oh, and he, also, he died of pneumonia. That was the, the cause of death. He's buried in Ira, yeah? It was signed by Kingsley. Yes, signed by Kingsley. Yep, and there's, there's a lot of overlap in the, the names. Uh, common names show up repeatedly. 
He's buried in Ira, which is where his wife was from. And note on the gravestone, Nichols. So no A. But just to keep it consistent, um, they spelled his wife's name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Laureate instead of Laurette. <laughs> so, you know, just, just keep us on our toes. So the A. Yeah. <laughs> When you were first yep. doing the family history, and mm -hmm. like what would have been his great story, why, how did they add the S? Oh, from, from, power from power, power to powers? powers? That I'm not sure. The family history just kind of glosses over it and says, it it, at some point they added an S. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a good point, because originally it was power. Yeah. And then it, it just became powers. powers. Yep. So, what is Nichols Power's legacy? Um, early on, he was well known. This is a newspaper from 1935, I think, uh, 1931. And this is where we see Gratz Powers, Nichols' grandson. He gives a lengthy interview and tells all the family stories about his grandpa in his bridge building. And I think this is where the lore kind of gets established. And this article is about the Blenheim Bridge. And they were thinking of tearing it down. And so this piece from the Albany Evening News is giving some background to who was this guy? Why is this bridge important? An early preservation project. And it was successful. What year is that? 1931. Wow. Um, I think I have that paper with me, if you want to see it. Yep, and some of the photos, and, and these are actually the letters that, act, that ended up at Vermont Historical Society. So Gratz Powers gave a number of things to VHS. Nichols Powers Builder, known as the best wooden bridge builder. So it's his claim to fame. Uh, 1940, there's this cover published uh, for Nichols Montgomery Powers. You know, the famous builder of the longest single span wooden covered bridge in the world, of course, Blenheim Bridge. You know, why was this put out in 1940? I don't know. It do, the date doesn't line up with any significant, it's not, you know, the centennial of his birth or, or a, you know, 50 years after his death or it, it just, you know, why, why this was put out then, I'm not sure. And Blenheim Bridge, of course, um, this audience you all know, longest single span wooden bridge in the world, lost in tropical storm Irene, rebuilt. but rebuilt. Um, and uh, when is the grand opening? June, June 29th, I believe. June 29th. Um, I had really hoped to go. I can't go, but you should all go because it, it's an We're incredible going. project. What's that? We're going. Excellent. And, yeah. Yeah, it's. No, I think they found some of the original timber, right? Is I think they incorporated a few pieces. One piece. One piece. Yeah. And one piece. So it's yeah. not just one piece. That's wow. it. There's an incredible. Um, actually, the last time I gave this talk, I think, was a day before the airing of the Nova Special, on this project, where they also talk about Chinese bridges. I think, um, in that Nova Special, if you can find it online, it's definitely worth watching. Um, his yes. Son is, his son was there too. Amazing project. So excited to go see that. But we heard it wasn't exactly the same as it was built before. Oh, Arnold, really? Arnold restored Lennon with his father mm -hmm. in the 80s before uh, it went down. Yeah. Yeah. And, but we, and his son says it, it's not like it was built the way it was. Hmm. It's it's it doesn't it, it ends in the middle of nowhere too. Well, yeah, matter. that's the thing. It, it's not it's no longer used for vehicular traffic. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a pedestrian uh, use only. But this was really interesting because the town fought with FEMA for years to get the money to rebuild this. And the question was, why spend the money to rebuild a covered bridge that nobody can drive on, no one can use, but. It was so essential to the identity of Blenheim, of this town, that not having that bridge, they had no sense of place. So finally, FEMA got that and put money into the project. 
the Brown Bridge in uh, Clarendon, uh, or North Clarendon, yeah. Um, that was uh, listed as a National Historic Landmark a few years ago and regarded as one of the best examples of a town lattice truss bridge uh, in the nation. And that was some of the early research where they, they really honed in on the Nichols name and they got it right on the plaque. Um, so it's a beautiful bridge and that too was affected by Irene but not to the extent that it had to be completely rebuilt. Uh, but. A uh, lot of money went into uh, rehabilitating it. So another view up in the attic of this house. Um, I mean, you can see here's a chunk of stovepipe, some random piece. There, there are actually quite a few trunnels up there, just lengths of oak um, dowels. Um, but on my last day. It was like July and about 150 degrees in this attic and I was done. <laughs> but there was one, this is sort of a, a sack. There's a story that the family would, uh, during the depression, to earn a little extra money, they would have uh, men from the railroad, which ran right through the backyard, through the farm fields. They let them sleep in the attic for you know a nickel a night or something. And they had these old, old gunny sacks and mattress sacks filled with straw and paper. So I picked one up, dumped it out, and found some wads of paper. And looked closely, and there are drawings on them. So took them home, very gently humidified them, flattened them out, and they are bridge drawings. So there's one here that shows a, a plan for a lattice truss here and the bottom cords laying out uh, how all the, beam, uh, all the boards are joined together and staggering the joints appropriately. And a detail uh, with um, how truss, it, although it's very strange because this should run this way. This is the center point and it's running out to the end. And if we zoom in, we've got all the dimensions, including what appear to be some sort of iron mm -hmm. tie rod, a steel rod from the top cord to the bottom cord. And at first I thought these were just layout lines just to get the geometry right, but this is labeled with a dimension. So that's, that's a part of the bridge. Yeah. He incorporated that in Christmas. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, to help hold everything together. Um, nine by nines, ten by tens, seven by eights. Members get smaller as you go out from the center. Um, so really an, an interesting document uh, with, with all the spacing. And then this one, which I apologize, is hard hard to make out, but it's a laminated arch with some sort of steel structure underneath, and all these either rods or guy wires connecting it together. You know, here's a detail with a steel plate that's kind of notched into the bottom end of this laminated arch. And then all these little pieces, all these little bolts and tie rods coming through. Um, I don't understand this design. I want somebody to look. I have the plans here. So if you want to look at them and tell me what the heck is going on, <laughs> that would be great. Kevin, I, I think I understand this only because I live with it. Mm -hmm. um, he, this is what he incorporated in the upriver side of the mill which he knew would, would be struck mm -hmm. first. And so he suspended the entire annex section mm -hmm. um, from the ceiling okay. without actually touching the rafters. Mm -hmm. he, it's a very an ingenious... So it's hung from the structure above rather yeah, than yeah. supported Yeah, and then it's all below. pitched together yep. with this very, very complicated mm -hmm. arrangement um, that's interlocked. Mm -hmm. 
using yeah, yeah. steel, using wood, using pegs, using yeah. everything, yeah. all in that one spot. So that gets back to all those catalogs that we found sure in the is. attic, all those supply catalogs. Yeah. He knew where to get all these yeah. materials. And another detail uh, showing how things are bolted together on the abutments. This is masonry. Yes, and so this is a, a masonry pier supporting the two ends of that uh, laminated arch. Is there any data on this one? No. And I have to say, you know, are these definitively Nichols Powers drawings? They're not signed. But they were found with everything else from his period of occupancy in the house. Um, I think it's a, it's a safe assumption. Um, so hopefully with this, you know, we've seen a little bit learned a little more about the person behind these structures because I think it's easy to get so focused on the bridge itself and the materials and the setting and we can forget that somebody built that. <laughs> you know, a real person designed it and built it. And Nichols Powers, um, I don't know of another bridge builder who has this depth of information about his life and the ephemera that informs yeah, his, guy. well, yes, <laughs> 19th century bridge builder. <laughs> um, and it's, a, you know, something that certainly I'll, I'll keep working on. I'm talking with the family about what happens to these materials um, if they want to keep them or give them to Vermont Historical Society because um, they, they really deserve to be available to the public eventually. Um, and there, there are things out there. The Blenheim Historical Society apparently has Powers chisels and workbench. There's, I found correspondence with another museum in New York uh, talking about getting his, uh, I think it was a drill press that would have been used to drill the holes for the trunnels that the museum wanted that for display, and this is back in the 40s. Wow. Um, so there's enough, he was well known enough that even museums were saying, hey, can we get Nichols Powers, you know, chisels or his workbench or his tools. Um, so really interesting guy and hope to, if I learn anything else, I'll, I'll be sure to share it with you. Thank you very much.